in person or joining us on the live stream. Uh, if you are on the live stream tonight, two things. One, we are really shorthanded tonight. Just Michael back there. So if you're going to send any prayer requests in, you need to get those in as soon as possible. And then also, if you're listening on the live stream, I remind you that next Wednesday night is a business meeting, so there will not be any live stream next Wednesday night. So you be mindful of that. And we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer as we get started tonight with our Bible study. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being our God. We thank you, Lord, for your word, your truth that you have given to us. And Lord, we just ask that you'd use it tonight, not only in our lives, but around us as well in this world. We know that this world needs your truth, needs to be manifested in your world. It needs to work in your world. We just pray it would begin in our hearts tonight as we study a portion of it. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake, amen. Call your attention tonight to the book of Jeremiah chapter 23. We looked at verses 1 through 20 in this chapter last Wednesday night. And now tonight we'll finish uh, the chapter verses 21 through 40 tonight. And I'll begin reading at verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed a dream. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who says, who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says, Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. So when these people or the prophet or the priest ask you, saying, What is the oracle of the Lord? You shall then say to them, What oracle? I will even forsake you, says the Lord. <clears throat> and as for the prophet and the priest and the people who say, The oracle of the Lord, I will even punish that man and his house. Thus every one of you shall say to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What has the Lord answered and what has the Lord spoken? And the oracle of the Lord you shall mention no more. For every man's word will be his oracle, for you have perverted the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus you shall say to the prophet, What has the Lord answered you, and what has the Lord spoken? But since you say the oracle of the Lord, therefore thus says the Lord, Because you say this word, the oracle of the Lord, and I have sent to you, saying, Do not say the oracle of the Lord. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and forsake you and the city that I gave you and your fathers and will cast you out of my presence and I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. May the Lord bless the reading and receiving of his word. Tonight we're continuing where we were last time to look at the failure of leadership. Of course, this is part two of that. We looked at the failure of leadership last time in the political realm. In Jeremiah's day, there was this failure among the national leaders 
in Judah. And we saw that and we saw what the Lord had to say about that and nothing's changed today. Just as we saw this failure in the political realm in that day with leadership, we experience a failure in that realm even in our day. And we began last time also to see failure in leadership in the spiritual realm. Now, <clears throat> what's going on in the political realm is important. I wouldn't say that it's not, and God spoke about it, so it's of some significance to Him. But you and I know this, that always what is going on in the spiritual realm should be more of a concern to us, and we're going to see that it was more of a concern to him. And so tonight, <clears throat> we continue to look at what Jeremiah has to say about this failure of leadership in the spiritual realm. And as we see what was happening in his day, I'm certain we will see something for our day as well. So let's look. <clears throat> Last time again, the political realm, then the spiritual realm. Tonight, we're going to pick up with and, I, and I'm gonna, we're talking about the prophets here, but I'm going to put it in a language that more, is more suitable for us today. We're going to look, first of all tonight, at the problem with the preachers. The problem with the preachers. If you listen to these verses earlier when I read them, and, and really, really paid attention, you should have related what was being said here to a great deal that is going on with those who call themselves preachers today. There is a lot of, I, I suppose they would call it preaching, there is a lot that is presented today that is cloaked as preaching that has nothing to do with preaching. And the, the most significant reason for that, that it has nothing to do with preaching, is that it offers nothing of the Word of God. That was what was happening in that day. And so the Lord speaking through Jeremiah, we're going to see begins tonight with this problem with the preachers in that day. The first thing that he talks about here in verse 21 is the problem with their call. He said, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. What about their call? They had none. Now, I believe this. I'm, I'm ignorant enough to believe this. The only people who, who should take up their place behind the sacred desk and proclaim, thus saith the Lord, should be those who have been called. I tell you, I'd have quit a long time ago, except for a call. And yet you, you had those in that day who the Lord says very clearly of them, I've not sent them. And I'll tell you this, you have those in our day that at least we'll start with this tonight and we'll move on and see what else we find out. But at least there has to be some question about their call. So the problem with their call, they had none. But then there was the problem with their converts. And I guess you could kind of say this also about that. They had none. And the reason for that is this. And, I, and I'm not saying people didn't follow them. We know they did, but they're not real converts. He said, but if they had stood in my counsel, that is, if they had proclaimed what I say and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. What they should have proclaimed was the word of God. Did you see that? Isn't that what he said? So what should we be proclaiming today? The word of God. Nothing has changed about that. And then you notice also not, what, not only what they should have proclaimed, but what, what that should have prompted. He said, if you had caused my people to hear my words, then they would, have turned it, they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. The people should have received God's word. The problem was they didn't get it. That's not what was being proclaimed. 
And then the indication is, if the people had received the word of God, they should have repented at the word of God. They didn't repent because they did not receive the word of God. So what happened? There were no real converts here. They, they didn't deliver the word of God. They didn't present an opportunity for the people to repent because they did not tell them what God had said. And so therefore, and we're, we're 23 chapters into this, so we know this. These people have continued on in this way in which God is speaking through Jeremiah and pronouncing judgment upon them because there's been no word to convert them, to change them, to turn them and bring them to repentance. Then there's not only the problem with their call, they had none, the problem with their converts, they really had no real converts, but there's also the problem with their concept that they were delivering. He says in verse 23, Am I, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? One of the things that was happening is that they were quest calling into question God's presence among the people. Either, and he mentions two things, I, I'm not sure exactly what the problem was, either one of them would be a problem, but either they were saying, which some people say today, God is way off out there somewhere, and you don't have to worry about him here because he's not here. Or, and you know that in that day, sometimes they associated uh, gods, little g gods, with a certain area, the God of this place is this God. And so they were saying, some of them may have been saying, God is near at hand, but he's, he's not afar off. One way or the other, they were questioning, though, God's presence. I believe there are those today who still question God's presence. And when you question God's presence, the second thing that you also kind of see in these verses is that they were questioning God's person. And do you know why I can say that? Because God in His person is omnipresent. What did He say? Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? Where is He tonight? Oh, He's high and lifted up on the throne of heaven. He's also right here. I feel heaven and I feel earth. He's in this church tonight. He's over there tonight. He's in my heart tonight. He's in your heart tonight. He is omnipresent. So by questioning his presence, they question his person. They seem to question whether he's anywhere and everywhere. And then if you skip over to verses 30 and 32, through 32, there's also a problem with their cause here. He said, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, He says, Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. There's a problem with their cause. What was their cause? Evidently, they said that their cause was to speak for the Lord. He says, you heard him say that there. He says this, he says that. They were saying that. Listen, people can say that God said anything. But we don't have to really worry about that. We know what God said. But he said this. You may say that you're my servant. And you may proclaim to people that you Speak for me, but I am against you. I think if I counted right, three times in three verses he said, I am against you. They may have said they were his cause was their cause, but they didn't have a cause because he was against them. And really he said, you, you'll profit nothing. You, you, what, what you do will be useless. What, what did our Lord tell us? Without me, you can do nothing. And really, he says to them, you, I'm against you. You're not going to do anything. You're not going to do anything. Well, that's the problem with the preachers. But you can probably guess what comes next. If there is a problem with the preachers, there is going to be a problem with the preaching. 
a problem with the preaching. And so in verses 25 through 27, you see, first of all here, the problem with their revelation. What I mean by revelation is that we're delivering something, we're revealing something, and it, it's going to come from somewhere, right? Well, what was the source of their revelation? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Where were they getting their messages from? Their dreams. They dream dreams. Now listen, Joseph dreamed dreams, but now God was involved in that. There is no indication that he's ever been involved in every dream that everybody's ever had. I've told you before about my wife. Every once in a while, she's going to have a dream. And she's going to get up in the morning and she's going to be disturbed by this dream. And one of the first things she's going to say to me after she tells me of this outlandish dream she's had, what do you think it means? Well, just so I don't encourage any of you to start that with me, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer I give her. And the answer I'm going to give you if you start telling me about your dreams. Nothing. What does it mean? Nothing. It might have something to do with what you ate the night before, but generally speaking, it means nothing. They dreamed dreams, and that was their revelation. They started to preach their dreams. And then, verse 26, he said, How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Not only did they dream dreams, but they delivered deceit. They could say whatever they wanted to. They could package it however they wanted to. Their, their intent was to deceive. That kind of tells you who was at the heart of their ministries. Who is it that wants to deceive? Well, the devil. The devil. And then not only do you have the source of their revelation, but look again at verses 25 through 27, there are the schemes from their revelation, the, the things that they kind of did from that, and we've already kind of mentioned one of them, but there in verse 25, he says of them that they promoted lies. They promoted lies from their dreams. They delivered these messages, and, and really all it was of what he says of them were lies. They practiced, verse 26, they practiced deceit. And then verse 27, if you look at it, what they intended to do was to turn away. That is, they wanted to turn the people away from the Lord. And he mentions Baal there. I don't guess it really mattered whether it was Baal or someone else. Their intent was to turn people away. So it was dreams. Listen, I know uh, we've already talked something tonight about being old-fashioned. That was before service for you that were on the live stream. I know I'm old-fashioned. I know, I, I've told you before, I'm a dinosaur and I'm on my way out. But I'm going to tell you something. We have a great deal that is being called preaching today that has nothing to do with the Word of God. It does not come from the Word of God. We have those who preach, and they, or I, I guess that's what you'd call it. I guess that's what they call it. And they make no pretense of even having the Word of God around when they do it. I, some of what I hear that comes from some, they may have dreamed it. Just as well have dreamed it as to gotten it from the Word of God. It didn't come from God's Word. And I'm going to tell you, there's a popularity with that in our day. We'd rather have dreams than have the Word of God. There's also the problem not only with their revelation but with their record. Verse 26, he says here, Indeed, they are prophets of, of the deceit of their own heart. I've already shared that with you about the deceit, but I want you to see this. When God says that, he's keeping a record, folks. He knows. He's keeping a record. And when he says that about them, that, uh, that these are prophets of deceit and they practice this deceit, he, he's counted it up. He's He's kept a record and he's, he's counted that out. But also he calls them just exactly what they are. Prophets of deceit. And then there's the problem with their results. 
verse 27, what, what should be part of the results of preaching, one of the results of preaching? There is a name that should be magnified. There's a name that should be lifted up. He said, who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbors, as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. I may have told you the story before about a fella that I know, a friend of mine, who he knew this. I thought this guy was his friend, but later I found out he, he just knew who he was. And this guy was just carried away with one of these folks that's going today. I mean, it's around today. And my friend asked him one time, he said, why do you like him so good? He said, oh, I've never heard anybody preach Jesus like he does. And my friend said, that's funny. I don't watch him, but I've heard him a little bit. And I've never heard him mention the name of Jesus. Can you imagine that today? even in our day, preaching that never mentions Jesus? And it happens. And then verses 28 and 29, he said, The prophet who has a dream, and let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. The, the, they should have been magnifying a name that they were not, but they should have been manifesting the Word. The Word, he says, that uh, is a fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You imagine their dreams could do that. They should be manifesting that Word. Well, there's the problem with the preachers. And with the problem with the preachers, there's going to be a problem with the preaching. And if there's a problem with the preaching, there's going to be some problems with the people. With the people. So in verses 33 through 40, we come to the problems with the people. I want you to notice, this is kind of interesting. I want you to notice here how they responded to the truth. Or I guess I really should have said that. How they had learned to respond to the truth. Have you learned to respond to the truth? I hope you have. I hope you have learned the right way to respond to the truth. But listen, and th this is easy to miss. But I don't want you to miss this. He said, so when these people or the prophet or the priest ask you, who's the you? Jeremiah, in this case. When these people ask you, saying, what is the oracle of the Lord? You shall then say to them, what oracle, I will even forsake you, says the Lord. Now listen to this. This is, this is really interesting. All of this is going on with these prophets and priests and the people are just loving this and they're, they're flocking to it. And the midst, in the midst of all of this, there's poor old Jeremiah preaching the word of God. And what, what ends up happening here? is a, a, a kind of a picture is presented of these people coming. And there's some suggestion that in the Hebrew it could be worded this way. So when this people or the prophet or the priest asked you saying, what is the bad news for the day? There's some suggestion that's what they meant when they said, what's the oracle of the Lord? Always count on Jeremiah to give us bad news. What's the bad news Jeremiah, what were they doing? They were ridiculing Jeremiah. He, you know what he said to them? He said, I have the best news of all. The Lord has forsaken you. He's through with you. He's forsaken you. They ridiculed Jeremiah. Oh, give us that bad news, Jeremiah. Where are we today in our world? If you stand and preach, thus saith the Lord, just the way he said it, without apology, you present it just like it is, you're going to be ridiculed today. I would guess, and this is just a guess, it really is not even an educated guess. If you ever, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to base it on. But I'm just guessing, and this is just based on a lot that I hear, 
that for every hundred of these fellows that's grinning and giving the people what they want, there may be one that is saying this is what God says. And those hundred or their followers will ridicule and say, oh, how foolish is that? How old-fashioned is that? Why do people keep telling that? Jeremiah, the only one they ridiculed. How about Jesus? Listen to this. This is kind of interesting, this first one. This was during his ministry. As a little girl, a father had come to him and said, My, my daughter's near death. And he had come to that place and found her already passed away. And he said to them, Make room. For the girl is not dead, but sleeping. Now, she was dead. But he referred to it as sleep because, you remember, I think we talked about this recently, or maybe we're going to talk about it again. I don't know. But he, he said, I've got the keys to all of that. Death is nothing to him. And the Bible says, and they ridiculed him. He said on another occasion to those grieving at the side of a tomb, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Really, it's the same thing he said here. Oh, she's not dead. The resurrection has shown up. And they ridiculed him. Didn't just stop there. Later on in Matthew's gospel, he's come to that place where he's given his life for the sins of the world. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 29, it says, When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They didn't know anything. He was not just King of the Jews. He was King of kings and Lord of lords. And they ridiculed him. And then verse 31, And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. They mocked him in his ministry when he was getting ready to resurrect the little girl, they mocked him right at Calvary when he's getting ready to die for the sins of the world. How do we respond to the truth? I'll tell you this, we better not ridicule it. I'm going to tell you, this is a day for the truth. And it is important that we all know how to respond to the truth. I, I don't care if it's bad news or good news. If it is the truth of God, we need to know how to receive it and how to respond. You see not only how they responded to the truth, but how they reckoned by the truth. Verses 34 through 40. You, you kind of glance through those verses. Maybe read through them right now while I'm pointing this out to you. Within these verses, there's several things going on here. The Lord is speaking, but he's also talking about what they were doing and you have in here the messages from them. What were they doing? And really, I, I should say it right off the bat, what are we doing today? Thus saith the Lord, the oracle of the Lord. That word oracle here, most people believe it should be translated the burden of the Lord. They were, they were proclaiming, oh, this is from the Lord. It's the Lord's burden. But then what were they doing? Giving their dreams, giving their lies, practicing their deceit. So what about the messages from them? It was just that. It was from them. And he talks about that here, that how that what they were giving was, was not from him. They could, call, they could say, thus says the Lord. They could sow the burden, the oracle of the Lord. But just because they said those things did not make it true. And then you have the message from him. What did he say? Well, first of all, he tells them why they will be punished. The whole idea here is you're going to be punished. And he tells them why in these verses. He said, you're going to be punished basically for this. You have said, thus says the Lord, and you didn't say what I said. You have said the burden of the oracle of the Lord, and you didn't give what I say. 
and I'm going to punish you for that very thing. There is no greater responsibility I believe that exists other than to give out exactly what God said. To say what he said. Nothing more, nothing less. And then he tells them in the latter part of these verses how they would be punished. First of all, he tells them they would be silenced. They, they've gone on, they've said, thus says the Lord, and the burden, the oracle of the Lord. But he said, you're, you're going to be silenced. I, I think there are a whole lot of people that have said a whole lot that one of these days aren't going to have a thing in the world to say. I've, I've, I don't know how I've looked at it. Maybe I've had different thoughts about it. But I've heard people kind of talk about things that one of these days that this, there's, this judgment is coming. And they, they kind of pictured this idea or had this idea that the individual is going to stand before the Lord and they're going to have an opportunity to argue the case. I don't think they'll stand. I think they'll be on their face and I don't think they'll have a thing to say. Not a thing. He says of them, they're going to be silenced. Listen, there are folks, they're flying around in jets. They're, they're pastoring, I suppose that's what you call it, churches that are in coliseums. They're, they're living the lifestyle, and apparently everybody's living the lifestyle with them. And they, when they open their mouths, from what I've heard them say, and I don't listen to it much, it didn't take me long to hear it. When they open their mouths, they never speak the word of God. Boy, fly your jets today. Say all you want to now. Live it up now because i got to tell you, there's going to come a day when you are silenced. And you're going to wish that at some point in time you had said, Thus saith the Lord and said it. Said what God said. Not what you want to say. When you said the burden of the oracle of the Lord and you presented what God says, not what you say. And then he tells them not only they would be silenced, but they would be spurned. He said, therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and forsake you in the city that I gave you and your fathers and will cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten they would be spurned God said I'll forsake you James little epistle of James kind of interesting little portion of the word of God in chapter 4 this is what one of the challenges that's presented to us lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up Lament, mourn. These are days for lamenting and mourning. And yet, what are we doing today? Oh, you can have wealth. You can have wealth, and that's the answer for everything that ought to cause us to lament and mourn. Ah, oh, you can have peace, and nothing bad ever happened to you. We're going to refute that one Sunday, some of it. So I'll leave that, I'll leave that for Sunday. But you can just you you can have such a wonderful life, no troubles, no problems. Where have you been? They preached all this stuff, and are still preaching it in an age in which there ought to be lamenting and mourning. He said, lament, mourn, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Same thing he's really saying to them here, and they didn't do it. And he said, I'll forsake you. I'll forsake you. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, the church isn't taking God's word seriously at an hour when the world is in serious trouble. Now, Wearsby's been dead for a while. A little while. So he said that, wrote that sometime back. The church isn't taking God's word seriously at an hour when the world is in serious trouble. I would suggest to you this. 
if we're in serious trouble or were in serious trouble when he wrote that, we're in even more serious trouble now. And the question has to be asked of us, are we taking the word of God seriously? These were God's people. But they had priests. And they had prophets who told them things they wanted to hear. And they loved that. So much did they love that that they ridiculed the prophet. Oh, what bad news do you have for us today? Listen, God's worst news is the best news if it brings you to the good news. It's funny to me, it always is, how no matter how much changes, nothing really changes. We're, I, I've said this to you already, in Jeremiah and probably in Isaiah too. I, I cannot read this without seeing right where we are today. Right where we are today. And I guess the question for us church is what are we going to do about it? Listen, the world I think, and I believe this, the world is in serious trouble. And part of that world, maybe most of that world, is not going to get out of that serious trouble. But the church ought to be doing everything it can today to tell everyone they can in this world what the answer is for the serious trouble they're in so that we might rescue some of the perishing. Maybe not all, but some. And how do we do that? We tell them what God says. We tell them who God sent. We tell them what God has done for them. Not what we dreamed up. Not what we think sounds good. Not what we think sounds better maybe than what God has presented. We tell them what God said. Amen. First, we have got to take the word of God seriously. Then maybe a lost and dying world will start to take it seriously. We're going to go over our prayer list tonight. Um, first of all, those that are grieving, we've had the Pretty family, the Stovall family, the Tucker family, sick, or some of these may be going through other difficulties, Vester and Barbara K. Atkins, Betty Bennett, Lewis Bottoms, Sandy Brewer, Kay Bullins, Francis Byron. We'll also add tonight Kurt Beasley, uh, Virginia Cardwell, Josh Church, Irvin and Ruth Cook, Heather Dixon, Mike Durham, Mandy Freeman, Michelle Gentry, Vicki Gordon, Alicia Gunner, Mitch Gwynn, Donna Hall, Dorothy Harris, Jim Harris, Betty Hawkins, Connie Hawkins, David Hawkins, Diane Hawkins, Heidi Hawkins, Luke Hayworth, Ruby Hayworth, Ralph and Opal Inman, Marcia Jones, Daisy Joyce, Diane Joyce, Reed Joyce, Katrina Knight, Jack Knight, Van Knight, Steve and Linda Leonard, Fred Lee, Dwight and Wilma Lucas, Annie Mae Mabe. Annie Mae's been in the hospital this week, but I think she's getting out tomorrow. I guess going back to the nursing home likely, but uh, that's the plan right now anyway. Terry Mabe, Ray Mabe, Elmer Manuel, Amy Marshall, Cliff Marshall, Mike Marshall, Sharon McMichael, Joe Melvin, Mae Miller, Adam Mitchell, Clement Moore, Peg Morfield, Earl and Helen Morton, Jack Myers, Hazel Nelson, Salem Nelson, Tom Norman, Angel Owens, Alfred Perea, Michael Petkov, Jimmy Presley, Lena Pretty, Larry Puckett, Woody and Evelina Robertson, Mike Royal, Jerry Rybovic, Faye Sands, Chase Sawyers, Donald Ray Smith, Fred Smith, Madison Smith, Teresa Smith, Annette Suther, Mark Southern, Jerry Southern, Betty Steele, Elva Stevens, Janet Stevens, Brenda Stovall, Gladys Stovall, we'll also add tonight Melvin Shelton, Melvin's been in the hospital this week. I think he had a, uh, some tests today, uh, maybe a stress test on his heart. I, so I don't know if he's still in the hospital or not, but he's been in the hospital this week. Coy Tucker, Gail Tuttle, Daryl Wagner, Greg Walker, Gary Wilkins, McCray Williams. I think he may come home tomorrow. Salem Williams, Betty Wood, Nicole Wood, Tommy Wood, William Wood, our military, Jansen Clifton, Jordan Hodges, Brandon Pretty, Seth Scott, Logan Smith, David Stratton, Justin Vernon, and Josh and Lacey Watkins, and other things we're praying about, the lost, our leaders, our country, our world, our missionaries, our church. And I've added tonight also revival. I think we need to be praying for revival. Any others that we need to add tonight?
Any others? others any to remove any others to add all right we'll go together to the Lord in prayer our most gracious and heavenly father will we thank you again for being our God and the privilege you've given us to gather around your word we also come before you tonight lifting these to you that are grieving we ask your comfort upon these families that you draw close to them during the time of loss in their lives we know other than these we've mentioned there also have been families that have been lost in the flooding we pray for those families who have lost loved ones as well and the circumstances they find themselves in we remember these tonight that are sick some going through tests some maybe recovering we just ask your blessings upon them we remember our military tonight that you'd watch over them be close to them wherever they find themselves we think tonight Lord also of those that do not know you as Lord and Savior, and we realize, Lord, day by day that it's a bad time to be lost. And we just pray, Lord, you convict hearts that they might realize their need and turn to you in repentance before it's eternally too late. We remember our nation, our leaders, and things going on here and around the world. We know it just seems to be a mess getting bigger all the time in this world, and we just pray you'd be at work in whatever way you choose to in those situations. We pray tonight, Lord, for our church that you'd help us to be a light during these dark days that people might see you and come to know you <coughs> as Lord and Savior. Lord, we do pray for revival. We're living in days in which we're sure we need revival. <coughs> and we just ask that you'd do that among us and throughout your churches. And we thank you again for Jesus Christ, what he did at Calvary, and what we know he's yet going to do. <coughs> and we ask this prayer in his name. And for his sake, amen. Good night and God bless.